we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, and we are going to start in verse number 1 through verse 13. So we'll do a little bit of reading here, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 of chapter 3, and we're going to read down through verse 13. Now it reads, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he had said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I command you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, whom you gave to me with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, and give you praises, my God, for this day, this opportunity to gather and to hear your word. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear and soften our hearts to receive the message you have for us today. We ask, Lord, that you, your Holy Spirit would move mightily among us today, that, Father, that you would begin now to break the chains of guilt and shame. Father, we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name, and all the saints said, amen. The title of today's message is The, the Chains of Guilt and Shame. And, I, and I, I say that because as I read that story there, you know, there, there's that that verse eight of, and they hid themselves. They, 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 they hid when they realized that they had done wrong. <clears throat> and then, and, and at that, in verse 10 there, it reads that they were, they were afraid. And that there is shame, that's shame. Verse number 11 and 12, they do something which a lot of us do when we're guilty of something, when we're caught. We start making excuses. Well, the woman you gave me, that's that's why I did it. You know, know, everything was good for six days, but then you gave me the woman, and then, you know, now I ate it. So it's on you, God. And then what is, so then he looks to her, and what does she say? Oh, well, it was the serpent that you created. You created this, this wily serpent, and so it's his fault. And so we make excuses when we're found, when we're found guilty. And, and so I want to speak today about guilt and shame. And there's a difference between them. They're, they're very similar in a lot of ways. You can almost cause, call them kissing cousins of, of emotions because they're very similar. They, they kind of always go hand in hand. You know, if, if, ever, if ever you um, invite guilt to a party, I'm pretty sure shame will be as plus one, right, or vice versa. They always seem to kind of, kind of work together and come together. They're, they're very similar. They're, they're both emotions. Both guilt and both shame are, are both emotions. Um, if I can, I got a slide here. Guilt is what we feel about our actions. Guilt is what you feel about what you did wrong. Shame is what you feel about yourself. See the difference? You feel shame because you begin to think that, that you're, you're no longer worthy, you're not a good thing. For example, guilt says... Guilt says, I did a bad thing. Shame says, I am a bad thing. I did wrong. I'm I'm a terrible person because I did wrong. That's shame. It's a little different than guilt. And and we got to understand these emotions all take place really in our mind, in our consciousness. And and we've talked about this in the past when we, we spoke about us being three parts, 
spirit, soul, and body. And the soul is your conscious, your, your, your self-awareness, your consciousness. And, and really those thoughts, those emotions of guilt and shame, they stem from your mind. And you got to remember in Proverbs 23, verse 7, it, it reads at the end of that verse, right? As so a man thinketh, so is he. As you think of yourself, that's what you are. And this is going to be very important. This is, this is essential in understanding how to free yourself from shame and guilt. Because basically, you're believing these thoughts that you're that thing that you're uh, um, degrading yourself down to, things that you're, you're putting yourself down to be, right? And, and again, they're, they're, they're just emotions. Guilt and shame are emotions. It's like, it's like um, something funny or something sad. Funny is an emotion to you. When you see something funny, you hear something funny, you what? You laugh, right? That, that's a manifestation of the feeling of, of something funny is laughter. That's the manifestation. That, that's, that's what you see. When you experience, hear, or see something sad, you what? You cry, right? That's the manifestation of that emotion. But the crying isn't the issue. There was an emotion to drive that crying, right? And we got to understand that guilt and shame initiate emotions that cause or create a physical reaction, a physical manifestation. It can sometimes come about like in the form of anxiety. You, you, can have, you, you, you think you're anxious and you might think you have health issues and you're anxious and, or you, you've got uh, headaches and stomach aches and you've got sleeping disorders or you're irritable all the time and Maybe you're, anger, or you're, you're, you're angered or you're always angry and you're withdrawing from people and you, you have this self-blame or low self-esteem or you feel victimized. And so you think that these things are a problem and these are not. These are just symptoms of the true sickness, which is your guilt and your shame. See, those, those are not, again, those, those are not the sicknesses. They're just the symptoms. You know, and, and we're really, real good, it seems like, in our day and age and treating symptoms, right? Like, like we had here last Friday, we had that wellness check going on and a lot of you came out and, and what they're trying to do is they're helping you identify issues before the symptoms arise. So you can take care of the problem before it's a problem. But we have a tendency to, to be reactionary and it's not our fault. That I understand that a lot of the medical industry and the insurance, really the insurance industry, they won't really pay for preventive care. They only pay for after it's a problem, right? Like if, like if you go in to say, do you have a knee problem and they want to x-ray your knee, but then you say, but you know, my shoulder's also hurting. Oh, well, you got to make another appointment to look at that shoulder, right? You know, I'm already here. You got the machine. We'll just move it up here. Take a shot of this. No, no, you got to make another appointment. Why? Cha-ching, cha-ching, right? So, so our, our, medical, our medical care in this country isn't really set up for preventive care. And this is why it's really important for us to start learning to take better care of ourselves. And I don't mean to, I'm not trying to make a message out of that. But we, we need to recognize that guilt and shame create symptoms, right? And again, the symptoms aren't the problem. Us withdrawing, us being anxious, that isn't the problem. What is the cause of that? It's the guilt and the shame. Now, let's talk about some of the differences of guilt and shame. And I'll talk a little bit about guilt right now, right? Now, guilt is... is is feeling guilty and, well, um, well, you can feel guilty, right? But not necessarily be guilty. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you, you don't understand? You, you feel like maybe you've done something wrong, but maybe you really didn't do anything wrong to begin with. Feeling guilty and not being guilty are not always the same. You can feel like you've done something wrong, but you really didn't. And then we end up carrying around this guilt with us, thinking we did something wrong. I'll give you an example. Let's say um, there, there was a family, family gathering, and all the parents are in the, the, the kitchen area and the, the, the family room area, and, and all the other kids or the cousins and everybody are in the uh, uh, other room. And, and one of the older cousins, who's kind of like the, uh, the cool cousin, right, the guy who, who's always kind of like the, the ringleader, you know, there's always that one, right? There's always that one ringleader who's... Everyone kind of follows and gravitates to, and he comes in the room, and, and he yells out to cousin number two and calls his name, and as cousin number two looks, he, in a millisecond, a nanosecond, he sees this, this humongous object hurling through space towards him from the corner of his eye, 
And with his ninja reflexes, he ducks and he avoids it. And then this, this thing that was hurling through space right at him then hits an expensive vase sitting over on the, on the fireplace. Now all the other cousins in the room, ooh, and then the, the one who threw the, the ball says, I don't want to mention any names. I don't want to, I want to try to protect the innocent. He says to the other cousin, he says, why didn't you catch it? You broke the vase. And the other cousin's like, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I was just trying to save my life. This huge meteor, I was flying through space. I thought it was going to hit me, and I ducked. And now the vase is broken, and now they're, ooh, you're going to be in trouble. And then all of a sudden, you know, the parents, the aunts and uncles, they hear the commotion. They come through what's going on. And then it's like, all of a sudden, Roger, well, the other cousin broke the vase. <laughs> he broke the vase, and I'm like, I'm sorry. And I was just ducking, and, and everyone's like, and then that, I'm now all of a sudden, I'm in trouble. I didn't break the vase. The guy who threw the ball broke the vase. You know, and, and, and but, but so, and I, I, but I, for years I walked around always self-conscious going to that family member's house knowing that I broke the vase. And like they're always watching me now like, okay, my, my, family, calls, my family calls me Roger John. But how many of you besides me, how many of you know any other Rogers besides me? Just curious. Oh, really? Okay, praise the Lord. I haven't met any but there were four Rogers in my family. I didn't know any other Rogers in school. I didn't know any other Rogers in the workplace, but in my family, there are four Rogers. So I'm Roger John. And uh, so, so, so now, I'm, every time I walk into the house, I'm thinking, oh, they're watching, you know, wh where's Roger John at? Where, where's he at? They're always like, want to check up on me, make sure I'm not around anything valuable. Like, I didn't break anything. But I always, every time I walked into that house, I felt guilty because, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the one who broke the vase. But I didn't break the vase. You see what I'm saying? So you, you can, you know, that's an example where you can feel guilty but not be guilty. And now, now let, me, let me go somewhere really sensitive right now. If there's any young kids in the room, I don't know, parents, you, you may want to have them step out. I don't know. But it's, it's people who have, who have experienced sexual misappropriations they've been molested and abused and oftentimes they feel like they did something wrong and you need to know today you are not guilty even though you may have been made to feel guilty you are not guilty you did nothing wrong the person who violated you is the one who did wrong just like the cousin who came in through the ball i didn't break the vase the one who threw the ball broke the vase. I did nothing wrong. And so if you, today you can be free from that, that guilt that you're carrying around, that you're thinking you did something wrong. You did not do anything wrong. And I need you, just the Lord needs you to hear that, that you didn't do anything wrong. You can stop carrying that around. You can stop thinking that you're guilty of something you didn't do. John chapter 8, verse 31 verse and 32 says, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And so if you're carrying around some guilt that you, you know you didn't really do, you can be free today. You can be free through Jesus Christ and stop carrying around that, that guilt, carrying around that weight. Now, and then there's also, there's also being guilty and feeling guilty. I mean, you know you did it, and so you feel guilty because you did do it. And, and so you, you just got, you've got this, this, this guilt with you that, that you're walking around carrying. But understand this, that's not such a bad place to be in. That's actually probably where you want to be at. Because if you're guilty and you're insisting that you're not, then that's a problem. But if you can recognize that you are guilty and, and acknowledge it, then you're on the road to recovery. Then you're on the road to healing. Right, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 in the ESV version, it reads, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. You need to recognize salvation has come for all people. And this is the thing that we oftentimes have a hard time understanding. That we're always thinking salvation's for the good people, for the people who, are, who have done good, the people, you know, the people like my wife, right, that, that, that God came and died for her, but he surely didn't die for me. 
And, and we need to recognize and, that this is the beauty of his love for us and his grace for us is that in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8, while yet we were still sinners, he died for us. And we need to understand that and accept that. You know, and it's like, it's like the, the sinner on the cross. And it's interesting because I, I think it's only in Luke 22 where this story is at, where you've got the two uh, criminals on either side of Jesus and one is mocking Jesus and the other one basically comes to Jesus' defense and says, hey, he goes, we deserve this punishment, but not him. He's innocent. And he says, would you remember me today when you go, when you go into to your father's house? And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. See, because he acknowledged, he said, I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty. The other guy had no reverence, no concern, but this other criminal, he knew he was guilty. And because of that, Jesus gives him that promise, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is where we need to be. All right. Now, so this is, this is guilt. This is recognizing what you've done is wrong and, and you just have bad feelings about it. You feel bad about it because you haven't maybe turned it over to God yet that he'll take it from you. We're going to get to that. Let's talk a little bit about shame, all right? Because shame comes via deception. You're hearing me? Shame comes via deception. Remember what I said earlier about what shame is? Shame is, is thinking that I am not worthy. Shame is thinking that I am less than. Shame is thinking that, that I, I, am, I am no good. I've done this, I am no good because I've done this. I am a terrible human being because I did this. And see, and this is why I say, this is, this is birth from deception. And who is the deceiver but Satan himself? Right, he, he wants you to think you're terrible. He wants you to think you're worthless. He wants you to think you're not worthy of God's forgiveness. He wants you to think that you are a disgrace to your family, a disgrace to yourself, and you can't show your face. I couldn't go to my aunt and uncle's house anymore because I may break something else because I'm a klutz or I'm, I'm disrespectful to people's things. Right, and so this is, this is what, what happens to us with shame because the devil is the master shamer. He's good and shaming. That's what he does. In Revelation 12, 9, it reads, So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Who, what? What does he do? He deceives the whole world. This is what he does. He deceives. And this is, again, I, I touched on this Wednesday night. But if you're ever in a situation where you think you're dealing with someone who's demon-possessed, there is no need to have a discussion with them. Because everything coming out of their mouth is a lie. So you have no need to have a discussion. You just cast out in the name of Jesus, right? Don't, no, why talk to a liar? You know everything that's going to come out is going to be a lie. Unless, of course, sometimes it's kind of humorous with those people, right? Where you know everything's going to lie. And you can say, oh, yeah, and then what happened? And then you hear a really big tale, right? But, but the, the devil is a deceiver. This is what he does. John chapter 8, verse 44, at the very end of the verse, right? It reads, but he is a liar and he is the father of lies. So, so when, you, when you start thinking that you're not worthy, that you're a fake or that you're less than, who's saying that to you? It's not God. That's what the devil says, but God doesn't say that. Psalm 139 verse 14 is very clear. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I love the second part of that verse is that marvelous are his works. You are marvelous. You are, you are great. You are great craftsmanship of him. You, he is the potter, you were the clay. He made you, he formed you. You are not, when you hear those things that you're not worthy, that you are, a, you know, you're no good, you're, you're not, you're not so worthy of his love or his praise, that is a lie. In fact, it's just the opposite of our Lord and our Savior. In Zephaniah 3.17, it, it reads that he rejoices over us with, with singing. That God, you've heard me say this before, because I, I always want people to understand this, that the God of the universe is singing over you. He's rejoicing over you. That's what God does. That's, how, that's what he thinks about you. That is completely the opposite of what Satan says. Satan says, you're not worthy. You're a liar. You're no good. You should be ashamed of yourself. God says, come. The Lord says, come. He says in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, all who are weary and burdened, come to me and I will give you rest, he says. James 4, 8 come near to God, and he says, and I will come near to you, he says. God calls us to come. Matthew 4 and 19, Jesus says, come, and I will make you fishers of men. God calls us to him. 
All right? This is, this is what God does. This is what grace does. Grace calls you. Guilt and shame repel you. They drive you away. Shame says hide and run. I, we, we touched on it already in the opening verses in, Gen- in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and verse 10. It read, they hid. They hid. They, they were shameful. They hid. Psalm 139, verse 7 reads, where can I flee from your presence? There is nowhere you can flee. You can think you're hiding. Adam and Eve thought they were hiding. They did two things. If we go back to the opening verses, first, they got fig leaves, sewed them together, and tried to cover up. And they hid. So they covered up and they hid. They still couldn't get away from the Lord. He still knew what they did. It's just like with King David when he has the affair with Bathsheba and conceives her and sends Nathan the prophet and gives him the story about, well, if a man took another man's sheep and all this, and, and he says, oh, man, that man should be put to death. He says, you're that man. You can't hide from God. He knows what you're going to do, but these are, this is, I, I, want to, I want you to know, but there is hope, there is restoration in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are, you are restored. You, all this guilt and shame could be obliterated today. You can leave it here at the altar and move forward and run freely. I was, I was thinking about getting one of those um, exercise vests. You ever see those things? They're like weighted vests. They weigh somewhere like 20 pounds, somewhere 40 pounds. And I was thinking about bringing one out here today and, and try to do a few burpees with it and then take it off and do a few more burpees without it and try to tell you that it was much easier without. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do the one with the weighted vest, so that's why I didn't do it. But this is what it's like. This is what it's like when we're carrying around guilt and shame. We're weighted down. We're bogged down. We're, we're, we're being held back. And so we need to recognize that there is restoration in Christ. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25, it reads, He will restore what the locust and the canker worm has stolen. He will, he will restore. He will, he will give us back what, what the devil has taken from us. And so I want to give you four keys to breaking these chains of guilt and shame. Okay, four keys of breaking these guilt and shame. He says, one one, you need to accept conviction. Yes, accept conviction. I've said this for years to people when I talk to them one-on-one, and I say this a lot. I say, I love conviction. I embrace conviction. I, I, I really do. I enjoy conviction because it tells me two things. It tells me two vital, vital things. One, in Romans 1.28, when he's speaking about their sinful, their sinful natures and their sinful ways, he says, I turn them over to their debased minds, basically to their to their, their, their sinful ways. Was, I just turned, he says, I turned them over. They, they, they're sinning, 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 sinning. I'm just turning them over to their, their, to their sinful ways. That's what that means there. I'm just turning them over. I'm, he's basically saying, I'm done. You, you, you don't want to change. You want to keep sinning. You're done. All right? So when I'm convicted, I'm like, okay, he's not done with me. He, because if, if he was done with me, I wouldn't care anymore. Because... In, in Proverbs 3.12, because he chastises or he corrects those whom he loves. And that tells me the Holy Spirit's still correcting me. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit corrects in John chapter 16 and John chapter 14. It speaks about the Holy Spirit's conviction and correction and guidance. And so the Holy Spirit's still convicting me. And so if I'm being convicted by the Holy Spirit, I'm like, that's a good place. The moment I stop hearing from the Holy Spirit, the moment that sin no longer affects me, then I, am, then I am lost. But if sin still affects you, this is the good news. If sin still affects you, that means the Holy Spirit's still working in your life. And then you can, you can give it up to God. You can give it to the Lord and, and receive forgiveness and be set free. When sin's no longer affecting you, then that's a, that's a tough place. Because then you're gonna have a harder time asking for help because you think you don't need help. But I want you to know, even if you feel you become numb to Christ, he still will, he will still love you and forgive you. All you got to do is confess. Acknowledge your sin. We're going to get into that here in just a little bit. All right? So we need to accept, key number one, accept conviction. I, like I said, I don't even accept it. I look forward to it. Accept conviction. Key number two, offer confession. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, right? That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. This is what he does. This is why he came. He, he wants us to be free. He wants us to, to receive his gift of grace, Ephesians 2.8. 
right? It's, it's a gift so that no man may boast. Right? He wants us to receive it, but we, but we got to we got to confess so we can receive His grace. And you know, in Luke chapter twelve, verses two and three, uh, it speaks about that there is nothing covered that will not be uh, revealed. Meaning, if you try to cover your sin, you try to hide it. Eventually, it will be exposed. Some people will, will paraphrase this this verse as to something like this: "What is done in the dark will be brought to the light." That's what's happening here in this verse. You're trying to cover, you're trying to hide your sin so you think that you're getting away with something. But like Adam and Eve in the garden, they couldn't hide. Like David tried to hide in his palace, having an affair with Bathsheba, he couldn't hide from God. Because you close the door and lock it, it doesn't mean God can't see. His x-ray vision isn't limited like Superman's. You put a lead wall up and Superman can't see anything. That's not our God. He can see through that. So locking the door, clearing your computer history doesn't make the sin go away. (laughs) It's still on record with the Lord. You need to take it to God. I'm sorry. I know it's really quiet in this Presbyterian church here this morning. (laughs) Love you, Presbyterians. All right. God bless you. Key number three. Repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9, that God's not willing that any should perish, but he desires that all would come to repentance. We need to repent. It's not enough just to say, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, we, we told our kids, we raised our kids all the time, don't tell me you're sorry, show me you're sorry. Stop doing the thing you're sorry about. You know, I, I, again, I told, sorry is just words. Yes, they're nice to hear, but if you go back the next day, the next hour, and just do again what you were just apologizing for, are you sorry for it? Have you repented? So he calls us to repent, to turn away, to stop doing what we were doing to begin with. Uh, 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 Matthew 3, 8, it reads, bear fruit worthy of repentance. That means to obey is better than sacrifice, is what that's saying there. That means your life should be producing fruit that's worthy of of repentance, meaning that I now, I'm no longer doing the things of sin, and so therefore I'm not producing bad fruit, I'm producing good fruit. Why? Because we know in in Mark 7, verse 8, it reads, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And so I need to be rooted in good soil with good seed so I can produce good fruit. But if I'm running around doing evil and wicked, then that's what I'm going to produce. All right, key number four is accept forgiveness. This, and you need to get hold of this. I kind of touched on it earlier about God's love, that he rejoices over you with singing. But understand that, just understand that he loves you. Like I I told you in Psalm 139, verse 14, where you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and and you are made in in the likeness of his image. Jeremiah 31, 3, right, that he has loved you, this Get this, that the Lord has loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31, 3. That's just something that, that is something that just, I I constantly have to remind myself. That he loves me with an everlasting love. He loves you. you. You need to get a hold of that. Even though you, again, you've allowed shame to tell you I'm not worthy of love. I am no good. I cannot receive this. I can't, I can't even show my face in that church. That is a lie from the devil. You are, you're welcome here. We will love you. We'll be an extension in the flesh of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But more importantly, his Holy Spirit's here and he will love you and, and he'll embrace you, redeem you if you're just willing to come on in, come to the Lord. Like I said, shame tells you to hide. God and grace tell you to come. And this is what we want you to do. We want you to come. Today, we're gonna want you to come to the altar. Whatever guilt and shame you have, we want you to leave it here today. We want you to be free. But right. you understand this, understanding God's love. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, it reads that if a, if a child asks a father for, for bread, does he give him stone? No, he don't give him stone. He gives him bread. He says, if he asks for an egg, does he give him a serpent? No. He says, this is, this is the kind of love the father has for you, that he'll give you as you ask. If you come asking for forgiveness, he will forgive you. You need to recognize that his grace is not limited. 
right? As and, and written in, uh, I think it's Romans 5.20, where sin abounds, grace evermore abounds. You can't out sin his grace. You can't. You're a finite mortal being. He's an infinite, all-powerful God. He has more love and grace than you could ever even begin to imagine. He's got so much love and grace that I'm up here preaching. This is the thing you got to recognize how wonderful and powerful and marvelous he is. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the, as the east is from the west, or this is, probably looks better on camera this way, but that's actually east over there. But as far as the east is from the west, so far has he taken our sins from us. Your sins are no longer with you. If you're bogged down, it's because you're carrying around your sins. You need to let them go. Stop and be free. If I can have the, the musicians come forward, please, and I'm um, getting ready to wrap this up. And here's something, too, that oftentimes people struggle with. And, they all, and, and, and I hear this a lot. I've heard it a lot over the years. I just can't forgive myself, Roger. Can't, I, get, I just cannot forgive myself. And I say, you don't need to. Stop. Because God, because Christ, Jesus, took care of it all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus, it's, it's like the only red letters in that chapter of 2 Corinthians. And, and Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you get what I'm saying there? When you're there saying that, well, I need to forgive myself, you're saying, it's like saying, you know, uh, Ben Garza back there, that Ben Garza's grace is more gracious and more powerful than God's grace. But God's grace is all you need. That's why Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Do you understand that? So if you're, if you're struggling with forgiving yourself, stop. That's like you try and do it on your own ability. This is the beauty of Christ. He wants to carry it for you. He takes it to the cross for you. You don't have to die on the cross. He has done that and paid the price already. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap, please, as you rise to your feet. As we close, I want to leave you with this, and I, and I want to make a, an appeal to you today. I want to appeal, I want to make a, an appeal to all of you, every single one of you. But here in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and under verse 14, Paul writes that, Brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended. He, or, 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 I'm sorry, to have apprehended. He's talking about apprehending the prize that he mentions the verse before, about uh, uh, obtaining and apprehending. You know, when you apprehend, apprehend a, a, a criminal, you, 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 you got him under arrest. You, he's saying, I've not arrested, I've not obtained that goal yet. He says, he says but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind me and reaching forward, Toward those that are ahead, I press toward the goal, which is Jesus Christ. But if we keep looking back, we're never, Jesus is before us. He's ahead of us. He says, come. Jesus doesn't stand behind us and back. He says, he says, come, come to me. And so today, I'm going to ask if there's, first of all, if anybody who's never given their life to Jesus Christ, and you're thinking, man, Roger, you don't know my story. You don't know the, the people I've hurt, the, the damage I've done to myself, the damage I've done to people's possession. You, don't, you, you have no idea, Roger. I do not. I don't. But God knows. And in spite of that, he went to the cross for you. And so if you have any guilt and any shame, you need to come and release it and give it to the Lord. You can come here to the altar and just put it down here. We'll pray with you, or you can come to one of these altar workers along the side, and they will pray with you. But you do not, you cannot let today pass without this being done if you've never done this. Proverbs 27, verse 1, right? Do, you, um, you, cannot, you cannot worry today about tomorrow because we do not know what tomorrow brings. We do not know if we're going to have tomorrow. You don't know if tomorrow's gonna be here, so do it today. Make things right today with our Lord and Savior. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. Now, if anybody else here tonight, 
I'm going to open this altar today again to everybody. If there's anything that you have any guilt about, any shame, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I want to pray for you. But before I pray, if there's any guilt, any shame you have that you need to release, we're going to ask you to come. We're going to ask you to come and leave it here at the altar. Father, we love you and thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this time to gather in your name. My Lord, I don't want to be weighed down anymore, my God, with this guilt and shame of anything. I want to give it all to you. So, Father, set us free today. For who the Son sets free is free indeed. Let us all be free, my Lord. No more guilt, no more shame. Draw us near to you, my Lord. Father, let us, we come against a spirit of pride that would keep us from coming forward. Humble us, my Lord. Let us receive your embrace. We love you and we thank you. Father, move on the hearts of your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Because you heal my heart.